tonight's event is an Ask Me Anything session with Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky. I'm so, so excited to have you with us. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. This place is incredible. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I have to confess to you that when we invented the Ask Me Anything, you were our dream person to have on the stage. Why so is that? this is a dream come true. Oh, we wanted to dream. be able to ask you anything. All right. <laughs> so Airbnb is going to be 10 years old. This year, that's yep. in, that's insane for me. So actually, we um, incorporated the company in June 2008, and we launched August 11th of 2008. So just over 10 years now. So you just celebrated your birthday. Yes, our birthday. Happy 10 birthday. years old. We're 10 year old. Happy birthday. Yeah, we're, that's we're awesome. still a little 10 year old. Thank you. Um, but tell me, what does that mean for the company? Are you guys still a startup? What have you been through? What's what's going on? What does 10 years mean to a company? You know, 10 years ago, I, um, I don't know how, what your stories are and how many of you always dreamed of having a startup, but I didn't really know like, what a startup even was. Like, when I was in my early 20s, I started the company when I was 26. I was 25 turning 26. And before we started Airbnb, I didn't really know what a startup was. I remember um, coming to San Francisco, and I met somebody, and they told me there was such a thing called angels. Uh, and they met angel investors, but they called them angels. And I thought, like, oh my God, this person believes in angels. What is going on here? Uh, I was really, really naive about um, about about starting a company. And you know, I, 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 again, the, 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 I don't go into the whole founding story, but it was just literally all happened one weekend. I always had a notion I'd be an entrepreneur, but just one weekend, this international design conference was sold out. All the hotels were sold. We like this international design conference was coming to San Francisco. All the hotels are sold out. We had an idea. We said, let's just turn our house into a bed and breakfast for a design conference. Um, I didn't have any beds, but Joe had three air beds. We pulled the air beds out of the closet, and we called it airbedandbreakfast.com. Um, if you were to ask me years later that like that would be a startup, we thought that would be crazy. In other words, when we created this, we had three people stay with us, a 35-year-old from Boston, a 30-year-old from India, and a 45-year-old father of five from Utah. And they literally slept like like on air mattresses, one of them in our kitchen. Like this was not like a premium hotel experience. And as we're waving them goodbye, I remember thinking Joe and I were looking at each other. We're like, we're ordinary guys. I bet you there's a lot of other ordinary people like us that want to make some extra money, meet cool people. I asked Joe, I said, who's the best engineer you know? He said, well, my old, my old roommate Nate is. And so the three of us got together and we said, what if we can build a website where you could book a home the way you could book a hotel anywhere in the world. And we built it, and we launched it, and we got two customers. And I was one of the two customers. So we actually technically had one customer. In other words, we launched it, and the product didn't work. Uh, people hadn't grasped it yet. And we like launched, and we launched. I guess if you launch and no one notices, did you really launch? So that was our point of view. And so we just kept launching. And it was a very, very difficult period. And we weren't starting this company to make money. We weren't starting this company to be successful. We started this company to solve a basic problem that we had and, and through the process realized maybe there was an opportunity for many other people. And so it really came out of this deep sense of passion and love to like be useful and do something really great for somebody. Um, can you talk about building a community? A lot of people, when they start out, they all tell me it's chicken and an egg problem. What comes first? The people aren't here. My product, I'm having trouble growing You know, the community. How did you guys get going? And what do you think are important steps to take in building a community? One of the most important pieces of advice I can probably give you is this something that Paul Graham told me. And he said, it's better to have 100 people love you than a million people that just sort of like you. Find 100 people and make them fall in love with your product. And you do that by doing things that don't scale. And so I think there's this inclination as technologists that we only want to leverage technology and do things that don't scale. And actually, sometimes the most important things you can do are the human moments. We went door to door signing people up. We went door to door living with people. When you bought an iPhone, Steve Jobs didn't come and stay in your house, but I did. We literally photographed people's homes. We helped them price it. We did everything. You see, the point is, as you design the perfect experience end to end, you do it by hand, and you recruit the community members one person at a time, they have a deep connection to you. 
As you meet with them, you develop an ethos, a purpose, a cause. You really have a sense of who the community is. And the most important thing is if you find 100 people love you, if they love you, they will tell 10 people themselves. Now you have 1,000 people. And if they tell 10, 10 people, you kind of grow orders of magnitude each step of the way. So I would say the summer, summary is get your hands dirty and build a community one person at a time. That's the single most important thing you can do. And as you do that, you'll understand their needs, their desires, their wants. And the most important thing is to know what to build. And you don't know what to build if you're not with your customers, living with them, experiencing the world with them, especially in the offline world. The most important thing, I think, is to make something remarkable. If you make something remarkable, then people will share and they'll tell other people about it. And I think oftentimes we edit our imagination and we stop short. And what we're really trying to do is make something that's delightful that people love. How have you guys built your company culture? How did you define your values, your vision? How do you cultivate that internally? So just where did the Airbnb culture come from? The Airbnb culture probably came from art school. I mean, so I and Joe Gebbia, my co-founder, went to the Rhode Island School of Design, which is this art school in Providence, Rhode Island. And it was a very creative culture. I mean, it kind of reminds me of walking around here. Not as nice, though. But um, other than that, it's kind of like this environment. It's very communal. It's creative. People don't have offices. They don't have like lecture halls. They have tables. You work on projects. You get your hands dirty. Um, what I want to say, though, is this. Um, I knew a lot of people who started companies who didn't care about culture. And when they looked at what I was doing and what Joe was doing, what Nate was doing, they thought we were wasting our time. They said, like, you should be building your product. You should be growing. What are you doing, like, building a culture? Like, how does the customer benefit? Like, you're wasting your time. The reason that we spend so much time on culture is it's kind of like this high-class problem. Culture is a shared way that you all do things. And the thing that will endure, if you, here's the thing. If you guys, if you start companies and you succeed, then you've succeeded in creating something. And then, then what do you do after you create it? Then people use it, and then you grow. And what do you do after something grows? Does it? Do you sell it, or do you keep growing it, or does it die? If you're creating a startup, it's like having a child. You want it to live on. You don't want it to just end in front of you. And so. You want to make sure that these things endure. And I always wanted Airbnb to be the kind of thing that endured. I mean, so much of a startup's like, hard work is like what you're doing right now. What's the point of killing yourself for like years and years and years, and then 10 years from now, your startup doesn't exist, and it's as if it never existed, and no one cares, and they don't remember it. Like That is actually quite futile. So you should think really, really long term. Well, the thing that endures in companies is the culture. Because the culture is like the source of innovation, the shared way of doing things. That's the source of all future creation, all future innovation. And so Airbnb, we created the original product. But eventually, the culture attracts a certain type of person that creates all future products for you. We would fly to different companies, study them. And then um, we really codified what was important to us. Before we hired a single person, we wrote core values. I think at the time we had like eight or 10 core values. We've tried to limit it into four. But the core values are like, what are things that you believe that the person sitting next to you doesn't believe about how you want to run your company? So core values can't be like everyone respects one another. Because unless you're the only person that has a startup where people respect one another, that's not novel and unique. So you know, at Airbnb, we basically said, um, Things like, um, we want everyone to feel like they're a host at heart. Like, deeply caring, compassionate person. Now, most people have an element of caring and compassion, but like, we were looking for people that were uniquely caring and compassionate. We wanted people that were like incredibly bold. Some people are bold, but we wanted people that are really bold. So we wrote a list of criteria, and then we, I personally interviewed, and Joe and Nate interviewed everyone. I interviewed the first 400 employees. And we would literally do things that didn't scale. And culture is also a thousand things a thousand times. It's not any one thing. It's all the rituals, every way you run your company, every way you do like everything you do. And I think that culture is so incredibly important. And it's going to be a competitive advantage. It's the reason people want to join you. So I think the time to build a culture is the moment of conception of your, con of your startup. And I think you can't wait to do it later. People who you're going to have a culture whether you design one or not. If you don't design it, you're not going to like it. And it's going to probably inhibit you and almost certainty, certainly probably guarantee you won't be around very long. People without cultures tend to sell their companies.
Wow, um, I love everything that you talk about when you talk about culture, because I think you guys have done a really, really good job, and I think you're right when you say it, it's so important from day one. Um, I want to touch now on a topic that's related to culture, learning from mistakes. <laughs> um, you mentioned, for example, uh, when you guys had that apartment that was trash, but what are some of the mistakes that you can share with us? How have you guys learned from them? How have you developed a culture that learns from mistakes? I think in society, we often stigmatize mistakes. Like when you take a test at school, um, to get an A means to not get anything wrong. And so, and there's a right answer. And the problem with startups is there's this weird power curve where it actually doesn't matter how many things you get wrong, so long as the things you get wrong aren't fatal, and that you get a couple things right. And those couple things that are right are really right and really big. And so, I'm trying to think of the analogy. Um, I don't know, I mean, baseball is popular in our, in, I don't know if it's sure it's so popular in France, but imagine like the game baseball. If, if you change the rules where a home run was, was equivalent to like a thousand runs, not one run. And uh, if that was the case, every single person would be swinging for home runs and they wouldn't care how many times they struck out. It would be worth striking out repeatedly because if you just hit a home run, you got like a thousand runs. That's actually kind of how startups are. And so, the, the main thing that we tried to do is learn, make a lot of mistakes, learn from mistakes very quickly, and be able to understand the difference between fatal mistakes and non-fatal mistakes. And when you're a startup, pretty much like nothing kills you except running out of money. Um, in fact, Paul Graham used to tell us, startups don't die of homicide, they die of suicide. In other words, it's very rare that like another company will kill you. And the way you'll die is you'll just kind of fade away and like you'll just kind of like you'll just kind of like decay into um, irrelevance, and eventually you're part of the abyss. Like that's actually how most of these companies fade away, and they they, they specifically fade away from like actually they just like kind of run out of money or they lose motivation. I've never heard of a small startup that got killed by competition. I think large companies do, but I've never heard of a small company die of competition, and so. I think just like uh, the number, the, the biggest mistake I've seen people make is um, probably just like not taking enough chances early on. But um, I guess some other things I would say that I, I, I do witness a lot of mistakes. We made some of these. I'll give you a couple tips. When you hire your first employee, you should ask yourself, do I want 10 more people like them? because you're gonna have 10 more people like them, because you're gonna empower them to hire other people, and you're gonna wanna include them in decisions. So number one, when you hire your first employee, ask, do you want 10 more like them? And so I think you'd be very, very thoughtful. You're not just hiring skills, you're hiring people. I would make sure when you're building a product that you actually do attempt to do things that don't scale, that you work backwards from an ideal use case, and, work, and, and I think that's like really, really critical. You know, I could probably list a bunch of things, but these were some of the really, really important things. And I think um, if you are really focused on creating a great environment to work and build a product that people completely love, and you pursue that, then you can kind of make a lot of mistakes along the way to get there. All right, well, I'm gonna go to my last question before we open it up to, yeah. to the room. Um, given that this is kind of the 10 year mark and you guys have come such a long way, what should we expect to see from you guys in the near future? What are the big innovations, the big projects, the plans that you guys have coming up? So, you know, we have, um, we started Airbnb with this core idea that people could share the homes they live in. Um, and on top of Airbnb, like original product were like three basic ideas that everyone would have a profile, people would have reviews and we'd handle payments. 10 years later, I think like, it feels like everyone handles payments. Back then, it seemed crazy. I think we were the first website that wasn't just like a bypassing of PayPal. We actually built our own payment system where I could book another person's thing, their house in this case, and pay them over the internet. And we would be an intermediary, and we'd hold the money as a custodian, and then pay out the host after the guest checked out. There was no system like that. And so at the time, in other words, that felt like a revolutionary. Today. Like all these things that seem revolutionary, like you look back on them like totally basic, like okay, whatever, everyone does that. And so we are constantly looking at the next frontier. Um, a couple years ago, we first entered China, 
Um, Airbnb China is one of the more successful um, consumer internet companies based at the United States in China. The list is very short of companies that are even in China in our country. And we have hundreds of people there, and we have 250,000 homes in China. Millions of people use the product inside and out. Um, in 2016, we launched Airbnb Experiences. I think Airbnb Experiences will be, you know, you know, there's no reason it couldn't be as big as our homes business. It will be a massive business. We have thousands of hosts offering experiences, over a thousand hosts here in Paris, offering everything from like, like art classes to like intimate concerts and like all different types of experiences. Earlier this year, we launched a product called Airbnb Plus. Airbnb Plus is really a kind of an up-level tier of products on Airbnb of homes. Every home has a 100-point inspection. We verify it in person. We do in-person inspections. We verify every single home by host based on cleanliness, comfort, and design personality. So we want to completely blow up Airbnb Plus. We want to design a whole ecosystem of services to support this community. We want to um, build out Airbnb experiences. And we're really going to build out this thing we're calling the Airbnb platform, which is basically build Airbnb as a platform such that hundreds of businesses, both inside of Airbnb and third parties, could plug into our ecosystem. And so I think just really scaling Experiences Plus, China, eventually Lux, and then building out the Airbnb platform, these are some of the things that I'm focused on right now. But I'm pretty sure 10 years from now, I'm going to be doing things way in addition to what I said just now. I think that companies become innovation machines. And as they grow, they can take on more and more. Awesome. I love, I love all the projects and the vision. Um, we're going to go to questions. First, I wanted to thank you, Brian, for um, being here today and giving us some of your time and for this inspiring speech on Airbnb. Um, so my question is, 10 years ago, no one expected that a visionary startup um, just that was just offering to sleep at other people's place would be changing the entire travel industry and the way we all travel. Yet with your um, pitch deck that's really famous now and um, that was very simple but yet incredibly efficient, you managed to convince investor and bring Airbnb to the place it is today, to the company it is today. Well, 10 years la later, um, do you think it would be still possible for a visionary startup that no one expects to bring investors together and be able to change the travel industry again. Um, and if yes, what would be your advice for such a startup? No. <laughs> no more travel startups. There's, there's only, there's no more. Just, we're done, we're gonna, no. Um, it was the turn of the um, last century, early 1900s, and somebody who I think was running the US patent office said that like um, they were speculating there wouldn't be any new patents that would be necessary because everything that could be invented had been invented. I think that it's hard for us to imagine that 99.999 kind of infinite number of nines uh, inventions haven't been invented yet. Um, we get so used to the way things are, and we sometimes ask ourselves why they couldn't be different. And we have to remind ourselves that everything around us was kind of designed and invented by people before us, and the vast majority of people haven't obviously come yet, and the change is accelerating. So my short answer is I believe that every single industry is in a constant state of reinvention that every industry will be in a sense a tech industry. Or said differently, there will be almost no industries in the world that don't have technology in them. And so, and I think that like our industry will look completely different in 10 years or 20 years than it does today. I don't think we just invent something and that's it. So I think that every time somebody's room invents something, it creates a furtherment of technology and advancement in how we live that opens the door for the next person to build on top of that. So it's just this giant like, fulfilling area. Um, the travel industry in particular is an industry that, uh, you know, hadn't really changed a lot in like 50 years. You know, there's like, it's hard to know exactly how many trips there were, but in 1960, there were 25 million people who crossed a border and traveled. Last year, there were 1.3 billion people. It is somewhere between 5 and 10% of global GDP. It's growing twice as fast as global GDP. And the travel and tourism economy and industry will become one of the largest sectors of the economy in the future. I believe that, um, you know, if you think about our economy today, what consumers buy, regular people buy, or they used to buy, were things. When I was growing up, I wanted to have like cool sneakers, and one day I'll have like a cool house and a cool car. And 
three out of four people under the age of 35 say they'd rather have an experience than buy a physical thing. I think we're going from a physical goods economy to a service economy and from a service economy to maybe an experience economy. I think that people will have more time in their hands. They're going to have more vacation time on their hands. I think the you know, five-day work week used to be a six-day and seven-day work week. In fact, everyone used to work seven days a week when they were farmers for the most part. Um, that five-day work week will probably become a one-day, a four-day, and three-day work week. Like We're talking over the next 50 years probably. And I think that people will be more mobile. I think they'll travel significantly more. Like When you hear the word mobile, what do you think of? You probably think of a computer in your pocket. I think a more literal definition of mobile is nomadic, as in like the way humans are, 300,000 years old, for 290,000 of those 300,000 years, we traveled. But we didn't travel alone, because we traveled alone, a tiger would eat us in the middle of a wood. So we traveled in groups. And so we traveled and we had this sense of community, this sense of place. The word tour, or tourism, comes from this notion of grand tour. The grand tour was something that happened 300, two, 300 years ago. Uh, wealthy children, typically uh, yet wealthy young men of aristocrats in Northern Europe, would take tours and they'd come to like here in Paris. And they'd learn painting. They would like live in Paris for six months and they'd take painting classes. And tourism mass produced this idea of painting classes became looking at paintings, became looking at paintings in a sea of 50 people behind a piece of glass, even though they don't know anything about art, they have no context, why the hell are they going to museums and looking at paintings? And it's because we want to get a sense of the culture. So I guess my point is that the travel industry is booming. It is you know, the size of oil, or maybe larger as an economy. That's massive. It is highly distributed. It is growing twice as fast as global GDP. It is, in a sense, an experience. If you ask people, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do? The number one answer, typically, in a survey, is I would travel. When we get married, we travel. When we retire, we travel. When we graduate, we travel. These are life events. And I think that this is the very beginning of a whole new industry. The travel industry should not be dis uh, just limited to people taking selfies in front of landmarks. I was near the Louvre today and there's all these people standing on these ledges doing like this stupid thing. Like they're like pinching the pyramid. It's like, that is so ridiculous. If you wanna know how ridiculous travel is, look at how people travel in your own city. And that's how ridiculous we all look when we travel. And so I think the entire industry is in a state of reinvention. The aviation industry needs to be reinvented. We are in the very beginnings of reinvention the, co the accommodations industry. The entertainment, experience, dining industries will all probably experience a massive change. And that's just the travel industry. And now extrapolate that to every industry that you know, everything is gonna completely change and the change is gonna accelerate. And so I think there's no better time to be an entrepreneur than right now. I think some people say, oh, the platforms are mature, mobile is mature, Google, Facebook, Amazon are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, there's no room for startups. And I think that is just kind of crazy because 99 point, you know, repeating nines of the change hasn't happened. Every single industry will be reinvented by technology and it's just the beginning. Brian, this has been awesome. Thank you, Thank you so, much. so much. I'm a huge for being fan here. of this program. Thank you.